And uh, a lot of, of what we talked about in the last section, we're, we're going to talk about again in this section and in the different projections that we're going to use. So again, there's going to be some redundancy between now and the end of the semester. <clears throat> Slight differences in the projections, but for the most part, they're going to be recycled. Really? Yeah. There we go. We're going to stay off this time. All right, so uh, we're going to talk about anatomy first, just like in the last section. We'll talk about anatomy and then we'll get into positioning. So um, you have 14 facial bones. Uh, most of them are, are duplicate. So you have a uh, left and right nasal bone, even though they're little bitty small and they're fused together and they're, they're uh, you know, we kind of consider them to be one uh, that, that is two separate bones. They're fused in the middle. Uh, the lacrimal bones, we'll take a look at the, the images, but the lacrimal bones are, are named after your tear ducts, uh, lacrimal ducts, uh, tear ducts just on the inside of your uh, eye and just kind of posterior, medial posterior to the nasal bones. You've got two maxillary bones, two zygomatic bones. Um, so we're going to talk about the processes that come together to, to form the zygomatic arch. You've got two palatine bones that extend posteriorly from your maxillary bones, and then you've got uh, the what, what I'm going to refer to as the uh, turbinates. They're the, the uh, scroll-looking bones inside of the nose. If, if you've you know seen a, a good waters or even a call well, you, you see these curly-looking bones that look like a conch shell. Uh, so you get, you have a left and right uh, inferior nasal conch shell type bones, conchy. And then you've got a vomer, a single vomer, and a mandible that comes in two parts and is fused in the middle. We're going to talk about the mandible separately. Um, we've got some special views of the mandible. It's kind of tough to image, um, but we'll talk about it separately in a different section. So we're going to talk about all that other stuff and fractures and those. So that's what they look look like from the front. So what you see here are the, the nasal bones. See so they're joined here and for such little bones, they're attached to a lot of stuff. You, you got a lot of things that connect to the nasal bones. You got the frontal bone, you've got the uh, maxillary bone on the inside, you got the ethmoid. It's, it's just got a lot of attachments to it. So the dark green there are actually your, your lacrimal bones. You've got your maxilla, you've got your zygoma, um, not to be confused with the zygomatic arch, which we'll talk about um, here in a bit. And then you've got your um, your turbinates here. Uh, those are the superior, these are the inferior, and then the mandible, which again we're going to talk about later on. So the nasal bones, too, very small, very prominent, fairly easily broken because of their position. Um, you know, somebody says that they've got a broken nose or they had a broken nose. Generally, that's what they're talking about. Not to be confused with deviated nasal septum, that's something totally different. So, you know, in a lot of, a lot of cases you can see um, you've got exterior indications that somebody's had a broken nose before. So if the bridge of their nose just looks a little, a little bit wonky, it means they probably had a, a broken nose at some point. Uh, the nasal septum is further inside. So the nasal bones are those things on the outside that form the, the hard part of your nose and then uh, the nasal septum is on the inside. So you got uh, articulations all over the place with it for such a little bone. Uh, the lacrimal bones, just talk about that. Um, okay, so there's a question on the test that, that refers to small bones that are easily fractured. So the nasal bones are very easily fractured because of their position, right? But the lacrimal bones are also easily fractured because of how thin they are. Very, very thin bones. And uh, a couple of our, our skulls, our acrylic skulls, positioning phantoms, um, are real bone phantoms, and if you look at the lacrimal bones, at least one of them is so thin that you, it's almost transparent. Uh, transparent, no, uh, translucent, right? So you can see light going through this bone, it's so thin. So uh, just because of how thin it is, it would be easily fractured if something hit it. All right, so I, I think, I'm just gonna give it away, I, I think the answer on that is both of those. Okay, so nasal bones because of the position, 
prominent out front. Somebody, you know, gets in a car wreck, the airbag break, breaks their nose. Somebody gets mouthy on the weekend, somebody else breaks their nose, right? That's your nasal bones. But the, the lacrimal bones, because of how thin they are, uh, they could be easily fractured. I don't know that I've ever seen a, a broken lacrimal bone. I don't know that you could diagnose a broken lacrimal bone on skull x-rays or facial bone x-rays. Uh, CT would have to, to pick that up. But also with your lacrimal bones, I've got a lot of articulation as well. <clears throat> All right, so the maxillary bone is the largest of the immovable facial bones. And notice it does say immovable. So you've got two big uh, facial bones. One is the mandible and the other is the, the maxillary. So the maxillary is, is the biggest immovable. Uh, when you chew, your mandible goes up and down, right? But your maxillary does not. Yeah, unless you got your chin on something solid, then your whole head moves. So it's the largest immovable facial bone that does not move. Um, <clears throat> so it forms a, a portion of the uh, the the uh, orbit. It also forms a uh, a portion of the bony hard palate. All right, so it's involved in a lot of different things. Um, we're going to talk about the significance of the um, um, the palate and fused uh, portion of the palate. So it forms three fourths of the roof of the mouth. So that's your bony hard palate. Your palatine bones are behind that. So it, it uh, they can they constitute the the posterior one third of the bony uh, hard palate. So um, whenever somebody has a uh, you know, they call it cleft lip or cleft palate. What you're really looking at there is failure of the maxillary bones to fuse, right? The palatine bones are posterior to that. And if they don't fuse, you have no exterior indication that they didn't fuse. You can't tell it. Likely if, if, the, uh, if the maxillary bones don't fuse, the hard palate, the, the palatine bones didn't fuse either. But uh, technically speaking, whenever we're talking about a cleft palate, what we're talking about is a failure of the maxillary bones to grow together. And you can see that, right? Um, you've seen the, the videos. I think there's a, a like a mercy ship type thing that goes over to uh, third world countries and does free surgery on, on little kids that have cleft palate. You know, seen the, those videos? Yeah. So um, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about cleft palate. So if palatine bones don't fuse as a cleft palate. Yeah, technically it is, but uh, really what we're talking about is failure of the, the uh, maxillary bones to fuse. All right, so <clears throat> they, uh, they have the zygomatic process. Um, well, let's get to that here in a minute. So uh, inside the maxillary bones, you've got the uh, maxillary sinuses, and we've got a lot of different words for maxillary sinuses. Uh, Anterohymore is one of them. Um, maxillary sinuses obviously but what we're going to talk about in, in the when we get into sinuses is they are kind of uh, shaped like an inverted pyramid right the points at the bottom and the broadest portion is at the top and in my experience this is where most of the diagnosable uh, sinus infections in, in my, my career have been right the patient comes in and they they're complaining of, of pain in the face uh, very good chance that they've got a maxillary sinus infection. And a couple of things about those uh, types of sinus infections is that with the, the filling of maxillary sinuses, sometimes a patient won't have pain in the face. What they'll have is a toothache. Because of where the teeth are in relationship to the maxillary sinus, um, sometimes it, that increase in pressure inside of the sinus can cause a toothache. Kind of weird. Also, somebody who has a, a bad um, tooth can also cause a sinus infection as well. So there's kind of some symbiosis going on there. So maxillary sinus are very prominent, uh, very large sinuses, um, and uh, very common to have sinus infections in those. All right, so alveolar processes hold the teeth anterior nasal spine is where the, the two bones come together. And we took a look at that. That's uh, essentially your uh, acantheon, right? 
where the two bones come together and form that little point is the anterior nasal spine. All right, so your zygomatic bones, that is your cheekbone. So um, it's that bone right there. So you've got the, the cheekbone, uh, the cheekbone connects to the frontal bone, connects to the maxillary bone, and it also connects to the, uh, to the temporal bone, right? So this thing here is what we call the zygomatic arch. So generally when, when we're talking cheek and you're pointing to the lateral side of your face, that's what we're talking about, a zygomatic arch, the, the cheek. But the cheek bone itself is the zygoma. Uh, common fractures here are depressed fractures of the zygomatic arch. Somebody you know, gets hit on the, the side of the face and you get a depressed fracture on the zygomatic arch. Um, <clears throat> so we're gonna have to be able to visualize that. But another common fracture is what we call a tripod fracture or a, uh, nah, that's a tripod fracture. And what that is, is a disarticulation between the zygomatic bone and its connection at the frontal bone, the maxilla, and the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. And in a lot of cases, you know, if, if you hear somebody broke their, their orbital bone, right? You've heard that before, somebody got in a car wreck that broke their orbital bone. Well, the orbit is made up of a lot of bones, kind of like the pelvis, made up of a lot of bones. You don't have an orbital bone but in a lot of cases, when they refer to the broken orbital bone, what they're talking about is that tripod fracture. It's disarticulated from all three of those points. That's tripod fracture. All right, so articulations, frontal bones, zygomatic process, maxilla, and sphenoid. So from a lateral, that's what we're looking at. Again, are the, the, the nasal bones are superimposed in this case. Uh, zygoma, maxillary, or maxilla, and mandible, and then your lacrimal bone there. So palatine bones, you don't see them. Uh, they're horizontal at the back of the, the hard palate. There's not a whole lot to, to talk about in the palatine bones since we don't see them, but they form um, the posterior portion of the, the bony hard palate. And you got the turbinates. So uh, if you don't know what a conch shell is, that's what a conch shell is. So you make an x-ray on a conch shell and it just look kind of like a tornado. Um, and it, because it's spirally, it kind of looks like a turbine, right? So we'll refer to it as a turbine. So vomer, a thin plate of bone situated in mid-sagittal plane, a single single bone um, it, that forms the inferior nasal septum. So when we have a, a, a broken or a deviated nasal septum, that's what we're talking about is the nasal septum. So what we're looking at in deviated nasal septum is that bone, I don't know if you can really see it, but it's that bone that is just the vertical line there and it kind of takes a dog leg, as we may say, um, and just kind of deviates to one side or the other. Again, um, you know, you can have broken bone without that being involved at all. Uh, some people are born with a deviated nasal septum, and sometimes, uh, you know, people will refer to a deviated nasal septum when they actually just have broken nasal bones. Okay. So the orbit itself is composed, again, of a lot of different bones. So you've got the frontal bone at the top, you've got the sphenoid and ethmoid bones deep inside, You've got the maxilla forming the floor of the orbit. You got a, a portion of the zygoma on the lateral side, the lacrimal bone on the medial side, and even the palatine bone forms a, a portion of the floor of the orbit. So it's got a lot of articulations. There is no such thing as an orbital bone. Um, it's just a lot of different bones that come together to create the orbit. So in the orbit, we've got specific things that we need to be aware of. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we've in skulls and anatomy of the skulls we, we talked about the superior and inferior um, uh, orbital fissures but you've also got the optic canal here all right so not only do we have this big spherical looking thing but it's not really spherical it's conical right so that the, the outer portion would form the base of the cone and the, the orbit uh, gets more narrow the further in it goes. So it's kind of cone-shaped with the point of the cone being in the posterior portion of the orbit. 
All right, so um, one of the views that's no longer in the textbook is what we refer to as the Reese method. Um, and it's a parado lacanthial oblique projection that we'll talk about here in a bit. And the purpose for the, for the Reese is to put the central ray uh, really parallel to the optic foramen so that we can see the optic foramen in a specific location that we'll talk to when we get to it. Okay, so any questions on anatomy? <clears throat> basic. All right, then our projections then of the facial bones specifically, we're going to look at lateral, we're going to look at waters, so that's really going to be the, the main thing that's new in this is the waters. We're going to talk about a reverse waters, uh, we're going to talk about a, a call well, and then we're also going to look at an SMV, and why that's not in, in here, I don't know, but an SMV um, to see the uh, zygomatic arches. So, I told you in the last section that uh, the, the main difference between the projections that we're going to recycle is going to be central ray location collimation, right? So in that, just kind of imagine, uh, you know, what it is you need to see. If we're looking at facial bones, we don't necessarily need to see the, the entire occipital bone, right? So instead of positioning your central, and we also don't need to, to see the top of the parietal bones. So in, instead of positioning where we did for the skull, with our skull, we went directly above the EAM, right? Put the central ray pretty much in the middle of the skull so that we could see the entire skull. But now the only thing that we need to see are the facial bones. The facial bones go from, you know, the articulations with the frontal bone all the way down to Technically, the, the bottom of the jaw, but since we're going to do a mandible all by itself, it's really to the, to the teeth, right? So this is really as far out as we need to go for the, the uh, nasal bones, and this is really about as far up and down as we need to go, right? So if I were to, to kind of pick a spot that was in the middle of all that, where would you say that spot would be? Is that... Zygoma, right. So what does it say in your textbook? Central ray location? Lateral surface of zygomatic bone. Bingo, right there. Lateral surface of zygomatic bone somewhere around halfway between the outer campus and the EAM. So pretty much right on the zygomatic bone. So put it on the cheekbone. Open up your collimation wide enough to include the, the nasal bones and far back enough that you would include, uh, you know, essentially the entire uh, zygomatic arch because it's a common facial bone fracture. Even though, you know, the zygomatic process is really a skull bone, it's, it's still considered a facial bone. So uh, put it where, you know, you're gonna see all the, the facial bones. Don't open up your collimation to include the entire skull, just from about midway up the forehead down to about the teeth and then out, you know, open up your collimation to include, you know, everything front to back, okay? So, <clears throat> collimate everything else off. So what you're gonna be looking for, uh, well, back to positioning. Uh, if you remember the positioning for lateral skull was to extend the chin until the um, infraorbital medial line was perpendicular to the front of the image receptor, right? Um, parallel to the long axis of, of the collimation. That's the same positioning here. So uh, really the only difference is gonna be central ray location collimation. Positioning wise, it's gonna be identical. The uh, evaluation is gonna be identical with the exception of what's included. So you're gonna be looking for superimposition of the orbital roofs. You're gonna be looking for rotation of the cella tersica. Everything uh, just like what we look for in a lateral skull, except for we're just not going to include the entire skull. Okay, pretty simple. So again, if, if you uh, learned all this in the you know skulls, then this should just be review, and you shouldn't have to look over too much. So it looks like that. So we see cell tersica, we see uh, the you know orbits. They included the entire mandible. Certainly, you would not go back and reshoot that to you know, call make the mandible off, right? But you see all the facial bones. Notice what you don't see well 
are the nasal bones, right? So the nasal bones, for the most part, we're going to shoot separate. Um, and they're so small, and we're looking through such a small area, and we're looking, I mean, central ray is almost going to, going to be directed straight to the, to the eyes, um, which we want to spare the dose to the eyes. We can shoot these and should shoot these either tabletop or at least in the bucky with the grid removed. Okay, there's absolutely no, no reason to be sh shooting nasal bones um, through a, a grid. So what you would do for nasal bones, and I know nasal bones are technically on this test, but we're gonna go ahead and talk about them real quick because I, oddly enough, I think there is a question on the test. So what you're gonna do for nasal bones is tabletop, that's number one, positioning lateral, just like everything else, uh, tabletop, and you're gonna to center to a point about three quarters of an inch below the nasion. Open up your collimation just enough to show the nasal bones. And then since you have two nasal bones, you're gonna shoot both laterals, okay? So tabletop, no grid, both laterals are the, the main things and, and collimate down to just the nasal bones. The main three things you need to know about um, lateral nasal bones. Any questions on those? All right, <clears throat> then uh, waters. So waters, um, we're gonna look at over and over this semester as well. But uh, the original waters is what we refer to as a um, parotomacanthial projection. So our central ray is going to come through the vertex of the skull and exit at the acantheon. That's the projection, the parietoacanthial projection. All right, so we have two different waterses, um, and it's going to be a little bit confusing to you. Well, let me see if I can get to them real quick and show you why it is that they are kind of confusing. So in your projections of everything else. Um, so if you're looking at a, a call well on page 38, for example, um, what you're angling to is you, you put, um, let's say, central ray position of part, orbital medial lines perpendicular. For a, a call well, you're gonna angle your central ray 15 degrees caudad, right? So it's 15 degrees, uh, 15 degree angle, central ray angle to the um, orbital medial line, right? Right? Orbital medial line is perpendicular. Mm -hmm. Central ray angulation is going to be 15 degrees caudal to the orbital medial line, right? So when we get over to waters, All right, so central ray is what? If you look on page 65. Perpendicular. It's perpendicular to the image receptor, right? But what we're gonna have here is the orbital meatal line is gonna form a 37 degree angle with the plane of the IR. IR, right? So with the Caldwell, the angulation formed is a, the difference between the orbital meatal line and the uh, central ray. With the waters, it's going to be 37 degree angle between the uh, uh, the orbital meatal line and the image receptor. Okay, so again, in Caldwell, what we're looking at is a 15 degree angle here, right, and that's going to press the the uh, the petrous ridges down in the lower third of the orbit with 15 degree angulation. 15 degrees to 37 degree, uh, you know, there's quite a bit of difference there, but the, the, uh, um, the difference in uh, the uh, perspective is going to be between the 
orbital medial line and the image receptor. In this case, what's gonna happen with the petrous ridges, which are right here on the inside, is it's gonna drop the petrous ridges all the way below the inferior portion of the maxillary sinuses. Okay, so if we go back again to the call well, uh, 25 degree call well, put the petrous ridges where? 25 degree call well, again, no such thing, but 25 degree angulation on a PA axial skull, put the petrous ridges where? In them, in the, inside the maxillary sinuses, right? But 37 degree waters, because of the, the difference in, in orientation there, the 37 degree waters is gonna put it all the way below, okay? So you're gonna have a tendency to, to look at the waters and you're gonna say, well, you know, there's central ray, we got a 37 degree angle to the central ray, and on a test question, you're gonna get it wrong, right? So it's 37 degrees from the plane of the image receptor. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna uh, uh, place your, your patient in a position kind of like a PA Caldwell or PA skull, and then you're gonna bring the patient's chin back pretty much until the, uh, the, the I'm sorry, the mental meatal line is gonna be perpendicular to the image receptor. So again, what we're gonna look at here We've got the inferior margin of the maxillary sinuses there. We extend the chin far back enough that we put the petrous ridges below that. Okay? So, since we put the petrous ridges below the maxillary sinuses, where, did, where else do you think we're going to see um, the waters? Sinuses. In the sinuses, right. We're going to see it again in the sinuses. So we're going to see, even though this is not a, this is a new one, this is not one that we've recycled, we will recycle it over and over again. As a matter of fact, I think this is one of the few views of the skull we actually might need to hang on to, and I'll show you why. All right, so here's waters. So uh, in the waters, can you see everything well? And the answer is no, but you can see everything, okay? So... What do you suppose that big dark area right there is? Frontal sinus. If the patient had a frontal sinus infection, do you think you'd see it? Yeah, you would. Um, those big things right there, dark things? Maxillary sinuses. Maxillary sinuses. That's you know, your view, your go-to view for the maxillary sinuses. All right, so uh, orbit. So a uh, common fracture of the orbit, and this is skipping ahead a little bit, Common fracture of the orbit is what we call blowout fracture, another potential orbital fracture. A blowout fracture occurs um, whenever somebody gets hit right in the eye itself. Fluid does not compress. Um, the basics for you know, hydraulic power and hydrostatics and, and all that. If you try to compress the eye, that fluid has to go somewhere. So what happens is a bone inside the orbit is gonna break and, and very commonly what's gonna break is the floor of the orbit. So if it's the maxilla forming the floor of the orbit, the upper portion of the maxilla forming the floor of the orbit, you get a fracture there, what do you suppose is gonna happen inside that orbit or inside that, with along with that fracture? Maybe some bleeding, uh, some edema, some swelling. Right? And what you may wind up with is fluid inside the maxillary sinuses. So somebody gets hit in the eye and they have a potential blowout fracture, again, you may have fluid in the maxillary sinus. Might they have fluid in the maxillary sinus because of sinus infection and they get hit in the eye? Yeah, they might. We've got views that, that can kind of help us to see that. We'll talk about that next. But um, fluid in the maxillary sinuses indicates that the patient may have blowout fracture if they got hit in the eye. So we can diagnose then that, we can diagnose frontal sinus infection, we can diagnose a uh, maxillary sinus infection, we can even see the, the uh, dens here, um, deviated nasal septum, so this is something we're going to look at in nasal bones as well, right? And now this is going to be uh, kind of like one of those things where you look at the clouds and and you uh, you know try to imagine what you see. So 
Just kind of follow along with me here. Um, and it's also kind of like whenever we were in spines when we talked about Scotty Dog. You all remember that? And some of you looked at it and said, I, I don't see that at all. And some of, some of you kind of saw it, right? Well, kind of the same thing here. All right, think of a zoo animal that has a great big ear. What does that zoo animal also have that's got a massive ear? Trunk. Trunk, right. So forehead, see this thing coming out here? Can you kind of make out how that's a little bit of a trunk? Okay, that's a zygomatic process is what that is. So uh, if a patient, and believe it or not, zygoma or zygomatic fractures, zygomatic arch fractures can sometimes be really tough to diagnose. If that was broken, could you see it on this? Probably so. So almost everything in the facial bones, sinuses, uh, nasal bones, some skull work, you can see on the waters. Uh, again, getting ahead a little bit into sinuses, um, your pediatrics, they don't have all their sinuses whenever they're first born. There's absolutely never any reason to shoot somebody under, say, seven years old, a full sinus series. They don't have all their sinuses, but they got those. They got those, right? So if you can see those on that one view, that's the only view you should, be able, should have to shoot for uh, sinuses on pediatric patients. Good view of the skull. Maybe the only good view of the skull. Okay? So, uh, what else can you see on that? That's probably close to it. Maybe something else, but nothing comes to mind just right now. Mandible, a little bit on the mandible. So you see everything, just not necessarily everything really, really well. Waters. Okay? So, there are, though, two waters. Is, uh, there is waters, and that's 37 degree waters. And there is also a reverse waters, or I'm, I'm sorry, um, a 55 waters. There is reverse waters. We'll talk about that in a second. So 37 waters align the uh, mid sagittal plane to the image receptor, extend the chin until the the uh, mental meatal line is perpendicular to the image receptor. Vertical or a uh, um, uh, parietal acanthial projection, right, is your waters. A uh, 57 waters is gonna sound to you like we need to bring the chin back further, right? So you got 55 waters. It seems like you got 37, 55 needs to come back further, right? But Remember that what we're looking at is the orbital meatal line and its, uh, its uh, relationship to the image receptor. So if the image receptor is here, what is my orbital meatal line orientation to it? Mm -hmm. Orbital meatal line is here. It's perpendicular. But what degree is that? Mm -hmm. hmm? What is that? Right angle is what? 90 degrees, right? So 37 brings us closer to parallel, right? So the bigger number means that we've got to drop the chin down, okay? Instead of extending it further, we've got to drop it down. And this is probably, again, where it might throw you off, is it would seem like we go from 37 to 55, bring the chin back further, but you don't. You bring the nose down until your nose and your, your chin is in contact with the image receptor. Okay, so that puts pretty close to the acanthomeatal line perpendicular to the image receptor. It's a 55 waters. And what that does is it takes the petrous ridges and it brings it up and it puts the petrous ridges pretty much in the middle of the maxillary sinuses, which sounds an awful lot like a PA axial, 25 degrees, right? Right? So the difference, really, the fundamental difference between 55 waters and a 25 Caldwell is position of skull in, in the uh, central ray. With the, the waters, 55 waters, what we've got is a perpendicular central ray and we've angled the head, as opposed to the uh, Caldwell, we've got the, 
the orbital mid line perpendicular and we've got the, the central right angle 25 degrees. So very similar in appearance, or really not that similar in appearance, but very similar in, in where we have the Petrus ridges. The appearance of that um, PA axial, the, the 25 Caldwell, is going to be dis distorted because we've got angulation on central ray, so it looks kind of dragged out, whereas the waters does not. All right, so again, nose and, and chin on the image receptor, and what that does is puts the, the uh, Petrus ridges into the maxillary sinuses. So you might be thinking, what's the point of that? You know, if we can see so much stuff on the waters, on 37 waters, why do a 55? And it's because of this, all right? So with the 37 waters, we've got that kind of an angulation, but the floor of the orbit is at a very steep angle, okay? So if we had that blowout fracture, could we see the, the fracture itself? The answer is no. Uh, because we've got that much of an angulation on the floor of the orbit, we're, what we're probably going to do is we're probably going to project the fracture back into its normal spot. And we're not going to see it very well. Okay? But what we do see then is the uh, fluid in the maxillary sinuses that, that might indicate that we've got a blowout fracture. Okay? But whenever we put the, the nose in the chin on the image receptor and we're in a 55 waters, it puts the floor of the orbit pretty much horizontal. Now we might be able to see that fracture. Okay? Evidence of fracture? Maybe we see the fracture. Okay? So our, uh, our views of the orbit, we just covered two of the views of the orbit along with the facial bones. If, we're, if you get a orders for orbit, most likely what you're going to shoot is 37 and 55 waters. 37 water shows you fluid in the maxillary sinuses, gives you an indication the patient has a blowout fracture. 55 waters, you might actually see the blowout fracture. Okay? So uh, there is one other view of the, the orbits we're going to talk about too. Um, generally speaking, uh, just for facial bones, minus the orbits, most of the time it's just going to be 37 waters. Orbits are going to include both. Okay? So most of the time though, you know, if you're doing facial bones or a lot of times, the patient's going to be on a backboard. They might have cleared them out of the, the collar, but they're still on a backboard. So you probably aren't going to be able to flip them over and shoot them um, PA. So you may have to shoot them AP. Or they may still be in the backboard or still on the backboard and still be in the collar. Um, so you're going to have to make adjustments to your positioning in order to, you know, accomplish the same thing. So if you can move the patient's head, if they've cleared them out of the collar, but they're still on a backboard and you have to shoot them AP as opposed to PA, then you just do the same thing. For 55 waters, you would extend the chin until the acantho line is perpendicular to now the backboard or the table, right? It's vertical. And for the 37 waters, you put the mento line vertical, right? But if they're in a backboard, they're probably gonna be probably pretty well positioned for 55. But for the 37, what you would do is you would angle your central ray until it parallels the mental meata line, right? So if they're in a backboard, they can't move their head, you're gonna angle your central ray for the 55 until it uh, parallels the cantho meata line, for the 37, the mental meata line. Reverse waters, okay? Everybody good with all that? Any questions? So that's a reverse waters. Again, you can't really see it. Looks like the patient has a, a maxillary sinus infection here. And uh, what you're missing here really is um, the odontoid process. So this is a phantom. So chances are whenever they, uh, yeah, it's a real bone phantom, but whenever they acrylicize this guy up, uh, chances are that filled up with acrylic, you know, and it makes it look like the patient has a, a sinus infection, which is kind of cool. This one's more open, that one's completely occluded. That's what a sinus infection would look like. Okay, 
So Caldwell is the same Caldwell that we looked at before. We just don't need to include the top of the head. Um, we don't need to include the mandible, um, but it's the same Caldwell, forehead and nose on the uh, bucky or on the table, depending on if you're shooting them upright or on the table. Um, angle central ray 15 degrees caudad. Your exposure field can be smaller now, uh, eight by 10 instead of 10 by 12. 15 degrees, exit snazion. Um, if you need to see the orbital rims, angle 30 degrees caught at. Right. Same as it ever was. So, uh, just call well. <clears throat> All right, so zygomatic arches. Um, we're gonna shoot some special reviews of zygomatic arches. Uh, this tangentials, this is the only place we're going to talk about tangential. I think I demonstrated this on, on the skulls a couple of weeks ago. But what we're going to shoot for the, the arches specifically are going to be your SMV and then possibly a Towns in order to visualize those. So for your SMV, uh, the same things that we talked about in SMV skull, we're going to uh, accomplish for these. The biggest difference here is that you're just shooting through a small portion of the skull, or a small portion of the facial bones really, um, you don't need a grid. So you can shoot these tabletop or in the bucky without a grid. Uh, again, the, the same things apply here as what applied in the skulls. You know, if a patient fell and potentially broke their zygoma, probably not a good idea to stand them up, right? Probably also not a good idea to put them on a rolling stool, put them in a chair. Um, and if at all possible, we're going to extend the patient's head far back enough to put the uh, infraorbital meatalon parallel to the image receptor. Now, this doesn't really show this all that well um, because the, you know, the, the top of the head is at least as broad as the zygomatic arches, okay? Um, <clears throat> so you're going to run into this problem sometime. Right? You need to see zygomatic arches, but you can't really see them because the top of the head. So if you've got a patient who's really got kind of a light bulb head, you've probably seen them. they got a, a narrow face and it just goes out, right? Then uh, you may have to do a couple of different things in order to see the zygomatic arches. One is, and you might consider doing this on all of your zygomatic arches, is reduce your SID. Okay? So how is that going to help? Well, here we've got about a 10 foot SID, which means that uh, we've got, you, you know, here in the, the middle of this screen, there's not a whole lot of divergence, right? But the more divergence you can take advantage of, the more it will project these, you know, zygomatic arches, since they're further away from the image receptor than what the, you know, the widest portion of the skull is, they'll be more, um, I don't know, more prone to uh, projection away from or misprojection than what's closest to the image receptor. Now, I've never done this before, so this might you know, completely not work out. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to hold this guy uh, just, just like it is, and I'm gonna walk towards that side of the screen. And we're gonna see if because we're at, at more of an angle over there, we're gonna see if that will cause zygomatic arch on that side to be projected out and away from the skull. So if this doesn't work, sorry. <laughs> sorry for wasting your time, but I just, look what's happening. All the way over here, it projects out so far. You know, I probably tilted inadvertently, so let's, let's try it again. I'm not even gonna look at the screen this time. Tell me when you can see it, if you can see it. Okay, all right. So you, so you see what's happening here is that because of the divergence of the central ray, so to speak, the divergence of the central ray, then what will happen is that with the great divergence of the central ray, you'll project the zygomatic arches away from the top of the head. So how you apply that is that if you need to see both zygomatic arches, if you reduce your SID, then naturally you're gonna have a wider divergence. Does that make sense? So instead of shooting at 
40 inches, reduce it to 30 inches or something like that, if your machine will allow it. Uh, sometimes on the wall bucket, it won't allow it. So how could you get open? How could you get past that? Any idea? Tabletop. tabletop. Just shift tabletop. Well, what if I don't want to put them on the table? Okay, well, just take it out of the bucky, put it on, you know, take your image receptor out of the bucky, be very careful with them because they're expensive. Put them on a table, right? Put it on the table, maybe tape it to the wall bucky, reduce your SID, still shoot a tabletop, right? So instead of 40 inches, maybe 30 inches, maybe even 25 inches to increase the divergence of the central ray, you should be able to project them out away from it. So what if you have somebody who's got a light bulb head and they've got a depressed fracture in the zygomatic bone? Well, we got special views for that too. So what we can do is we can oblique the patient's head and really, uh, it's still oblique, but it's, it's kind of a tilt more so than oblique. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna tilt the patient's head so that the chin goes towards the side that, um, that you wanna see, okay? So notice you won't see both of them. If you reduce your, your SID, you should be able to see both of them, but um, you're just interested in seeing one. Rarely are you gonna see somebody with both zygomatic bones broken or zygomatic arches broken. So it's a unilateral view, so you're gonna tilt the chin towards the side of interest, okay? And open it right up. Now notice it doesn't take a whole lot of tilt, just a little bit of tilt, right? And you go much further and you're gonna start projecting the mandible in onto the zygomatic arch. So just a little bit of tilt, okay? Just a little bit. <clears throat> now I do wanna show you something that's a little bit confusing in the textbook. Find it real quick. <clears throat> Here we go. Tangential projection. <coughs> All right, so um, on page 77. So it says uh, hyper extend patient's neck and rest the vertex the head on its vertex. Adjust the position of the patient's head so that the IOML is parallel as possible with the plane of the image receptor, just like you know the, the SMV that we talked about before. Now it says, adjust the position of the patient's head so that the IOML is parallel as possible. No, we just did that. Rotate the mid satchel plane of the head approximately 15 degrees toward the side being examined. And then it says, tilt the top of the head approximately 15 degrees away from the side being examined. Sounds kind of contradictory, doesn't it? But it's not. What it's talking about is this. All right, so step one was in, in those two things, rotate the mid plane of the head approximately 15 degrees towards the side being examined, right? So what it's saying is if we're looking for the, uh, the left zygomatic arch. We're gonna to rotate towards the side being examined. All right, do you see it? No, no. It doesn't come into play until you tilt it, right? So it's saying rotate towards the side of being, being examined, and then it says rotate the top of the head away from the side being examined. All right, so the top of the head is here, so top of the head is coming this way. Chin's going that way, top of the head's coming this way. Okay, so it sounds a little contradictory and a little bit confusing, but really, essentially, the, the 15 degree tilt or the 15 degree uh, turn of the head really doesn't do a whole lot except for put the zygomatic arch pretty much parallel with the image receptor. If you can't remember both of those, the more important of the two is the tilt. Okay, that just makes it look a little bit prettier, but I mean, fundamentally, is there gonna be that much of a difference? answer is no, no, not really. I don't even think your radiologist is going to complain about that. Even the picky ones. Okay? So any questions on tangential? Oh, the, the other thing about the tangential is, you know, everything else that we've shot so far is bilateral, entire face. 
This, all we're looking at is that one zygomatic arch. So your central ray location is gonna be on that zygomatic arch and your collimation is just gonna be down to that, that side of the face. Very minimal collimation, or very, very minimal exposure field. A lot of collimation, right? So uh, again, tabletop, that's a, your depressed fracture of zygomatic arch there. Uh, both of them look real good on the second one. Tangential here. Um, again, you're just looking for one side. You can call make that down even further than that. Okay, so Towns method is another potential view. You know, if the patient can't move at all, then uh, <clears throat> You can use Towns method and hopefully see it. Um, it's going to be tough to visualize. If you remember on Towns, our, our Towns, everything looks real stretched out. So what we're going to do with the Towns in this case is we're going to lower our central ray to make sure that we can can see both zygomatic arches. And you might, since uh, since the only thing we're looking for is zygomatic arches, what you might do is uh, back off on your technique. If you're photo timing, you might hit it with like minus one, minus two, something like that. But what we're looking for in this case is just the zygomatic arches here. Okay, so we're gonna back up. 30 degree caudal angulation, just like before. Uh, enter at the glabella about one inch above the nasion, so slightly lower. Um, 37 degrees at the OML, it is perpendicular, so just like the, the previous towns, uh, our exposure field can be quite a bit smaller, uh, 10 by 12, even 8 by 10. So just make sure that you open up wide enough that you get the zygomatic arches positioned low enough that you can see them as well. So that's all you need to see, you don't need to see the vertex of the skull. So there is one more view that um, is not in your textbook. I thought I added it. There we go. No. That's not it. Let's see why I thought that was it. Just looking at it. Here. on it. All right, so uh, Reese method is um, a double angulation on the, the skull. So what you're going to do is you're going to start off kind of like a, a 37 waters. Don't do this to your patient, by the way. But the Reese method, the purpose for the Reese is to try to put the central ray parallel to the optic canal, which is what I've got going on here. All right. So what we're going to do with the Reese method is we're going to uh, extend the patient's chin. I said a 37, but it's a 55 waters. Um, extend the patient's chin until the acanthomedial line is perpendicular to the image receptor. And then you're going to oblique the patient's head 53 degrees. <laughs> okay, really specific. 53 degrees uh, towards the side of interest. And what I've got here is I've got that pencil sticking right through the optic canal. If you look real closely, you can kind of see where the pencil's coming through the sphenoid bone right there. Is it? All right, so that is your optic canal. And the purpose for the Reese is try to put the optic canal perpendicular to the image receptor. So uh, <clears throat> this double angle, 
uh, 53 degrees back and, uh, I'm sorry, 50, uh, 55 degrees back, 53 degrees oblique, okay? And that puts it perpendicular to the, uh, to the image receptor. So the easiest way to position for a Reese is to put um, the cheek, the nose, and the chin on the image receptor, okay? So not to be confused with tripod fracture, this is what some people will refer to as three-point landing, all right? So what you wanna do is you wanna, uh, to position for this, in a lot of cases, what you can do is just put an X on the, the bucky, you know, right in the middle of the bucky, or on the tabletop and, and tell the patient, I want you to put your eyeball right on that thing, right? And uh, once they put their eye on it, just oblique the patient's head until their cheek, chin, and nose are all either on the table or on the wall bucky. Extend the chin until the, you know, those three things are on the wall bucky. All right, collimate down to just the area of the orbit itself and where that should project the optic canal is pretty much where you're seeing it right now. All right, so if I were to cut the optic canal in half, or the, the orbit in half from top to bottom and also in half from left to right, you got four portions to that, you know, thing to this thing right here, right? Four portions to it. Anytime we have four of anything, we call those quadrants, right? So you got four quadrants. So if I were to draw one from top to bottom and from, you know, from outer to inner, this being inner, then where would you, which quadrant would you identify that in? Or if you're looking at this, which quadrant would you identify that, the, where the pencil's coming through the orbit? where it's coming through the, the, the outer portion of the orbit. It's right here, right? So this is upper, this is lower, lower this is inner, this is yeah. outer. So yeah. where it should put the optic canal is in the lower outer quadrant, okay? So what do you need to know about the, the Reese? Put those three things on the, the image receptor and that's where it should put the uh, optic canal is in the lower outer quadrant. Um, <clears throat> double, du double head angle, so uh, extend the chin, oblique the head, 53 degree obliquity. Should put the optic canal in the lower outer quadrant, is the Reese. Uh, so if you happen to be working in a clinical site where they actually do these, you're gonna have a tendency to, at some point, um, change the three points of contact. So it's always gonna be chin, cheek, and nose, all right? But at some point, uh, may it, maybe it's because of somebody you're working with or whatever, they're gonna have a tendency to swap it around to forehead, cheek, and nose, okay? But notice what's gonna happen there. So we've got chin, chin, cheek, and nose here, right? If you go with forehead, cheek, and nose, Petrus ridges are back here, What's gonna happen is Petrus ridges are gonna come up, right? And the outer portion of the orbit's gonna go down. And what's gonna happen is that your, um, your uh, optic canal is not gonna be in the lower outer quadrant. What it's gonna uh, tend to, what might happen is the Petrus ridges may be projected directly on top of the United C. Okay? Chin, cheek, and nose, not forehead, cheek, and nose, okay? All right, so your routine for facial bones, usually gonna be your waters, maybe Caldwell, lateral, always, SMV for cheekbones, can't get cheekbones, uh, maybe a Towns, right? But for your orbits, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do both waters, we're gonna do a Reese, and possibly a lateral. Um, and a lot of times the lateral is to see like metallic objects in the eyes and things like that. Almost a soft tissue view. Okay. Any questions? <clears throat>